Hello, and welcome to the Biomass Magazine podcast. I'm your host, Anna Simmet, and today I have with me again our first ever guest who we had chatted with about a year ago, Bill Strauss of Future Metrics. Bill, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you, Anna. Good to be here. But Bill, last year at this time, there was a lot going on in the industry um, overseas. We were seeing pellet shortages due to the ban of Russian product. We had some U.S. producers sending pellets over there, spot price jumps, price increases. It seems like a lot of that's died down. So could you fill us in, Bill, on you know what's happening right now, what the big story is? You bet. You're right in terms of pricing, particularly on the, the spot price has kind of returned back to what I would call a more normal range compared to where it's been in previous years uh, and last year for sure. So you're right, the market has settled down a bit, but I think there's still quite a bit of uncertainty about what's going to happen coming into the winter months uh, this year into next year. A couple of things that help the market settle down from last year's record highs are that the demand for pellets was less than expected last year. Uh, And there were a couple of reasons for that. One reason uh, is that it was a very warm winter in Europe and demand for heating pellets was significantly lower than typical. So there was excess capacity in much of the production for heating pellets in parts of Europe. Uh, As you may recall, we discussed last year, the loss of Russian imports was serious Uh, Russia exported in 2021 about 3.4 million tons. Russia, Belarus, and Ukraine, the three countries. Uh, A good portion of that 3.4 million tons, uh, 3.5 almost, came into Western Europe. So that's what drove prices uh, last year to record highs, both in the industrial spot market and also in the heating markets. The shortages that were predicted as a result of that loss uh, didn't really materialize. And as I said a moment ago, part of that was an extremely warm winter compared to normal in Europe. But there were a couple of other reasons, and these are very important reasons. One is that the use of pellets in the two big power stations in the UK that are under the contract for different scheme, that's uh, Drax and Limeouth, um, one of the units at Drax and the Limeouth facility. Uh, the contract for different scheme was essentially upside down last year. What I mean by that is that retail prices or the, the reference price uh, was significantly higher than what's called the strike price in the support scheme. So very quickly, the way that scheme works is the two big power stations are guaranteed a certain revenue per megawatt hour. And if the retail rate is below that, which it typically has been, the government, the UK government, makes up the difference, thus contract for difference, uh, to make sure that the power station gets a stable revenue per megawatt hour. However, if the rates are higher than that that strike price, then in fact, the utility has to pay back the difference, not receive the difference. So there were all kinds of market forces uh, that promoted the um, non-use of pellets in those units. One being the contracted pellet supply into those units that would have been burned was actually sold into other uh, markets at high prices, higher than what Drax, for example, paid for them under contract. And uh, there was a profit to be made there versus no profit to be made from generating electricity on those units. So that was at least a million tons a year of demand that was not realized in the UK. The other big reason is the power station that's purpose-built in England, MGT, at Teesside, has been super delayed in its startup. It was supposed to have been running a year and a half ago, and there have been multiple delays in commissioning. Uh, So that's about a million tons a year of demand that didn't materialize last winter either. Expectations now are that that facility will be running by this winter. So that means that million tons will be used. The expectations on what's called the bark spread, which is 
kind of a fancy way of saying, will the Drax and Limeouth units make money on the contract for different schemes? Um, looks positive going into the fall and winter months, which means they'll be generating again and consuming well over a million tons a year between those two units in demand. So if it's a cold winter or even a normal winter, MGT comes in line, Drax and Limeouth go back to normal burns in their uh, biomass uh, fueled units. It could very well be that that Russian shortage raises its ugly head again. Mm. So we'll see. There's, there is a potential for uh, prices to be quite volatile this winter. Mm. So, Bill, EM plus requirements are coming back. It's a good thing. They're important. Do you think that's going to have an impact on pellet availability in Europe? No, not probably not. Mm -hmm. However, I think the flexibility shown in sort of suspending the N plus requirements wouldn't will not go away if, in fact, there are issues with getting enough pellets into the heating markets in Western Europe. I'm sure we'll see policy evolve in a way to allow pellets. I think if there's a choice between only certified pellets or folks not being able to heat their homes and businesses, Mm -hmm. uh, I think we'll see policy allow people to heat their homes and businesses. Okay. So, Bill, what about um, in terms of the U.S.? What are we seeing right now? Looks like we have some new capacity coming online. What does it look like here? Well, in terms of production capacity, yes. I think we certainly have seen plans for an expansion in in production in the United States and to some degree in Canada as well. And in other areas also, uh, we're seeing uh, production, uh, new production projects in uh, in South America, the Southeast Asian region. Uh, So back to your question about the United States, the model is to match production capacity to demand. And certainly the major producers have done that. You don't see large pellet factories built on speculation in North America. They're built against contracts to buy product. And therefore, as demand grows in regions around the world that the United States and Canada can supply, uh, we'll see new capacity. Certainly, there are advantages to parts of the Southeast U.S. in terms of wood supply, quantity and price, and access to uh, ports, logistics, and all that sort of thing for certain solutions for the world. So I think we'll continue to see the Southeast U.S. be competitive in global markets as demand rises. And I also think that there's real potential, and we talked about this last year, uh, for uh, demand in the United States. So far, every pellet produced in the United States, industrial pellets anyway, not heating pellets, Mm -hmm. Uh, is exported. You know, millions of tons of of pellets are exported. Uh, In fact, the United States, 2022, yes, exported almost 9 million tons, just shy of 9 million tons. Canada exported just about 3.5 million tons. So none of that's used (laughs) inside our countries. Uh, I think that's going to change. The Investment Inflation Reduction Act, the IRA, has some reasons why we think that bioenergy, carbon capture, and storage, or BECs, will become a major component in the U.S.'s uh, decarbonization strategy. And the only way to get carbon negative is BECs, or is bioenergy, is BECs, rather than just CCS. So uh, using biomass as your fuel, uh, you're actually subtracting CO2 from the atmosphere. Uh, So we think that's going to be a scenario that plays out pretty strongly here in the coming years. Mm -hmm. So um, you mentioned the IRA policy. Are there any other global policy items to be watching right now? Yeah, you know, there's some some activity in Europe. Uh, There was just some news a a few days ago uh, about uh, Germany. There's always some thoughts about uh, some other uh, European nations, uh, such as Poland. We think uh, the German market is is ripe. We actually wrote a paper on this a couple of years ago Mm -hmm. uh, for many reasons, pragmatic reasons. But for political reasons, it may or may not evolve. There's a pretty strong anti-biomass element in Germany. There's also uh, pretty strong lobbying for uh, the wind and solar uh, uh, sectors. And we'll see. But, 
you know, we've talked about this before. Um, if you want, basically, uh, if you want controllable on-demand power generation, you need thermal generation. And the only way to do that in a carbon beneficial way is to replace coal with pellets in coal power stations. Wind and solar are not controllable. You're at the whims of nature, uh, and they're in, uh, therefore they're intermittent and variable. You need that base load and on-demand generation to keep the grid stable. Uh, so I, from a pragmatic point of view, it makes a lot of sense, particularly uh, given the uh, loss of some nuclear capacity, but we'll see. Certainly in the areas where we've seen a lot of growth, that would be Japan and South Korea, we see continued uh, significant growth in the Japanese market over the coming years. There's a little more uh, um, growth yet to be had from the uh, independent power producer side uh, based on the feed-in tariff projects that have yet to come online fully, but will be coming online in the next year or so. And then the next phase of growth in Japan is going to be we think, from the major utilities beginning to co-fire, perhaps in a few instances even fully convert from coal to pellets. There's several reasons for that in the Japanese market based on policies that uh, have been promulgated. And these things are all with a target date of 2030. So between now and five, six, seven years from now, we think we'll see pretty major growth in demand from Japanese utilities. So, Bill, I saw you recently published a white paper regarding the Japan and South Korean markets, correct? Yeah, it was. It was actually a little different than our typical white papers. There was, mm -hmm. It was a PowerPoint uh, type presentation. Essentially, it was just some charts and tables, mm -hmm. mostly charts, actually, showing uh, historical growth in, in those markets and uh, also some uh, comparisons between the two markets. You know, Japanese market has grown with a nice upward sloping curve that's getting steeper which means growth continues. Recent months, imports into Japan have been somewhere in the neighborhood of 500,000 tons per month. So that's a pretty significant, uh, that's 6 million tons a year, wow. approximately, on just wood pellets. And that growth uh, trajectory, we think, is going to continue. One interesting uh, characteristic of the Japanese market is it's been dominated, er, in the early days, it was dominated by Canada. As demand grew, Vietnamese suppliers stepped in and around 2018, 2019, Vietnam took more market share in the Japanese market than Canada. And that sort of remained the case since until recently. And exports from the U.S. have increased dramatically in the last year. And market share for the U.S. now is somewhere in the neighborhood of 25%, not quite 25%, 20-25%. Canadian market shares remain steady at somewhere in the neighborhood of 30-35%. But where that U.S. growth has created an impact is on the Vietnamese market share, which has declined from an average peak of around 55% to down around 40-45%. So the U.S. Is, is coming online for the Japanese market. A lot of this is uh, Inviva's contracts into Japan and shipments out of the U.S. finally are kicking in to the Japanese market. Mm -hmm. Interesting stuff. So my last question, just shifting gears a little bit, Bill, is the buzz about black pellets kind of come in spurts. What are things looking like right now in terms of that market? Yeah, great question, uh, Anna, and I think it's a question that requires some attention for sure. And black pellets are one of those, you know, it's crying wolf type things. I mean, for a decade or more, it's been the next big thing in terms of pellets, uh, you know, better than white pellets mm -hmm. in many ways. But we've not seen any real penetration into the market, any significant penetration by black pellets. Uh, there's been a couple really good reasons for that. One is straight economics. To produce a black pellet takes more input wood per amount of energy in the final product. There's a, there's a loss in the thermal treatment. So you're kind of behind the eight ball from the get-go in terms of wood costs, which means your cost per unit of energy for a black pellet just by default has to be higher than the cost for a white pellet. Uh, so in a competitive market, and particularly for those plants that have already invested in the dry storage solutions, white pellets are the cheaper solution. 
And plus, there's 24 million tons of white pellets traded in markets last year, industrial pellets, not not heating pellets. And it's hard to find that many tons of black pellets traded. So there's also a security of supply in the white pellet market with multiple suppliers from multiple sources. So that's some inertia there that has to be overcome by the black pellet folks. Mm -hmm. But we're still pretty positive that certain types of black pellets will uh, become common going forward. The torrified pellets, there's two types of black pellets, essentially torrified, and the other is what is becoming now uh, a bin coin steam cracked. That's by a company in France uh, that's making uh, these pellets, and it's been, always been called steam exploded. But I've never thought it was a good idea to use the word exploded when you're talking about a fuel. Anyway, <laughs> so the, uh, the torrified uh, pellets, I think, are going to find a home in not so much uh, the energy in power stations, although there might be a niche there, but uh, for other uses, and particularly uh, substituting for coal and coke in the steelmaking industry. I think there's real traction there for uh, taking biomass and essentially taking a carbon beneficial fuel uh, product, uh, like a, a high carbon content black a torrified pellet, and using that as steel manufacturing. For the steam exploded or steam cracked pellets, we actually visited a, a factory in France last April, myself and one of my colleagues, and we're quite impressed. Uh, the core technology is solid. It's a continuous process. And it's also um, uh, built in such a way that it's almost a drop-in solution. So a, an existing white pellet plant could, in fact, drop in this process in the middle and produce either white pellets or steam exploded or steam cracked pellets, I should say. But once again, you still have the losses from the thermal treatment. But what's interesting is these losses are being captured this is be, that was pioneered by the Norwegian uh, company Arbiflame to uh, capture these reaction gases and strip out the valuable biochemicals. The most valuable of which is furfural, selling for two to three thousand dollars a ton. And so that mass loss actually becomes a value add, a revenue stream. When you put that together, and you have essentially two offtakes now from a factory like this, you're selling the uh, fuel pellets and you're selling the biochemicals, primarily fur for all, you can actually make enough money on the chemical sales, if you have a good uh, a regular offtake agreement, to allow competitive pricing on the pellet sales. So there are opportunities going forward. There are, we, we know of several major companies that are looking to decarbonize, but don't want to spend the money on dry storage. Dry storage is quite expensive. For a power station, it can be 50% of the cost of the modification just for the domes or silos for the pellet fuel. Uh, if you can avoid that and you have a competitive price in terms of cost per unit of energy, that would be a pathway that I think people will follow. So we're pretty pretty positive on the future of at least uh, for uh, black pellets in these markets. Uh, we'll see. Maybe next year we can revisit this and see uh, see if we're right or wrong on that. Absolutely. I look forward to that. So Bill, we're about out of time, but I just want to thank you so much for coming onto the podcast again and filling our listeners in on you know, what's going on in the industry. You're most welcome, Anna. It was my pleasure. And to our listeners, thanks for tuning in. Until next time.